Hello there, everybody. It's me, Gary Kidney, the co-host of You've Got to Be Kidding Me on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. And I am Liam Jones, my full name, and I am also a part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network as a co-host for You've Got to Be Kidding Me. We are a TNA history podcast that covers TNA one month at a time. We cover all the drama, all the matches, all the Vince Russo nonsense you could ever want in your life. Have you you heard of TNA? I bet you have. But would it be funnier if two people made jokes over it the whole time? Probably. So if that sounds like fun to you, check it out on this very Voices of Wrestling podcasting network, and Liam will do bits and whatnot. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hey there, Thunder Buddies and Travelers Down Thunder Road. It's us, Days of Thunder, the WCW Thunder Rewatch podcast that you didn't ask for, but we did anyway, coming to as part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network and powered by a large man appears.com. I am your host, your technical difficulties on Thunder Road, Dave Ryan. I am joined, as I am every week, by my faithful co host, Stagger Lee Malone. Lee, how are you this week? Oh, I'm not too bad. Uh, looking forward to this show. Big double header. And. Mm. Uh, it will be, of course, the week where we're both incredibly busy. Um, yeah. Where our shoot lives do not cooperate with us. <laughs> like, I came back um, from my holiday, more of which and on, and uh, it was in the Discord with you, and I was just like, wait, we have to watch what? <laughs> I think we both knew this show was coming this month, but had no recollection it was this quick after the pay-per-view. No, I was stunned when I realised it was so, like, the week after SummerSlam that they actually debuted SmackDown. And then um, someone, someone uh, helpfully, if we hadn't already remembered, tried to remind us in the Discord. And we were like, yeah, yeah, we have to watch that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's great, uh, double header. Well, hey, look, at least WWF put on a good show. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> they put on a show where more things happened. That's yeah, that, one thing that we cannot deny. That that's what I mean. It was just yeah. Any, anyway, we'll get to that in, in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um Yeah, so like I said, I I was on holiday the past week, went to Lisbon, first time. Um that was good, nice and relaxing. I didn't watch a single second of wrestling while I was away, which was good. Uh, you missed um, nothing. Yeah, played some video games, watched a bunch of TV when I was trying to relax and stuff like that. Uh, I've got really into um, the Doughboys podcast. Have you ever watched okay. the, watched or listened to the Doughboys podcast? No, I have not. It's, a, it's two comedy writers who uh, each episode they have a special guest on who talk about their favorite fast food chain, basically. But that's kind of like a... That's basically the excuse for them just to like riff and bullshit and chat away and okay yeah i was like it, it also kind of like it's good because we're people that we've talked before about our fascination with american fast food chains and mm-hmm. we've spent you've spent more time than i have in the states i've spent a little bit of time uh, on a couple of holidays over there and it's something that has become a feature of snack talk and i feel like this is like the if we exploded out snack talk into a full podcast it's basically doughboys Okay, um, I must. I'll put it into a rotation and, and have a listen. Yeah, I um, I, I, what kind of got me into it was there being a few like comedy people I really like that were on it. Okay. Um, so that's like with a lot of these things, you know, when it's a podcast where there's a guest on every week, when you find the podcast you originally start out like listening to the ones with the people you know, and then mm-hmm. you kind of branch out from there. Um. So, like, the first one I saw was, like, the Black Angus Steakhouse episode that had Tim Heidecker on it. 
because uh, I love Tim Heidecker. Um, there was an episode that had Scott Aukerman of uh, Comedy Bang Bang fame on it. Uh, one of my favorite people in comedy and podcasting, uh, Jason Manzukas, did one of their Halloween specials as well. Love mm-hmm. Zooks. Um, gotta try to think. Kamel Nanjiani did one about um, Howlin' Rays, which is a place I've always promised myself if I go to Los Angeles, I will go to Howlin' Rays. It has okay. like the. I don't know if it's still, but at one stage claimed to have the spiciest chicken on earth. Uh, chicken that was so spicy that it was once featured on First We Feast and caused Sean Evans of Hot Ones fame to nearly die trying to eat it. Like, and if it's if it's too extreme for Sean Evans All in right. this day and age, it's bad. Um, but it's a yeah. it's a no, okay, it's, it's a, I've never actually heard that place, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a like. really good show that has... Um... Oh, do you know who was on it recently, actually? Who? Samoa Joe. Oh, no way. Yeah, he did an episode all about Taco Bell. So uh, that's something you can definitely uh, get into if you uh, if you fancy it. Um, that, that might be a good opportunity to start. Um, I'm just going through the list of like episodes I've seen here. Like Stephanie Beatrice from um, Brooklyn Nine Nine did an episode. Oh, cool! Not yeah, too long ago. L- l- love uh, Stephanie Beatrice. Yeah. Um, so you will find people. Scott Aukerman's episode was about Orange Julius. I was trying to remember what his was about. Um, Jamie Loftus was on it. Who I like. Paul Shear. Speaking of um, Jason Manzuka's Paul Shear was on an episode. Um, talk about Chipotle. So it's yeah, it's ah, it's a really good time. It's really really enjoyable um, podcast. And if you're somebody that likes to have a podcast in video form on in the background while you're like working or doing something, they have they now video record all the episodes. Okay, um, is, um, is it on YouTube or it's on YouTube? And then if you just want the audio version, that's on your your podcast apps. Um, so yeah, that's that's a really good um, really good show that I would uh, highly recommend. The other thing that I'm going to recommend, because I don't really have an appropriate, like my other podcast, I think maybe on Link to the Cast is maybe closer to the genre, but it doesn't, it really defies genre. Um, A YouTube channel I found recently through another podcast. The YouTube channel is called Bobby Fingers. And it's, it's a guy from Waterford in Ireland who his whole thing is like, it's almost like ASMR, but it's like him talking real slow in a real kind of Waterford accent while he builds plasticine models of like dioramas from famous embarrassing incidents in celebrity history. So Um, you told me about this when we were at uh, All In. Did I? You did. So yeah, his first episode is him doing a diorama of Mel Gibson's drunken arrest uh, from the 2000s. The, the second one is a, a diorama of the time of the story that is told of Steven Seagal getting choked out and shitting himself um, by Judo Jean LaBelle. That, um, that was the one you told me about. Yeah. Uh, the third episode is when Michael Jackson's head went on fire. Oh, and sick. the one that just came out this week, it's his first, he only drops these like one or two a year. Like by the looks of the the timestamps and some of these, this is the first one he's done in eight months, and it's him building a full scale rowing boat shaped like Jeff Bezos's head, <laughs> and he really <laughs> experiments with the form in this because it turns into like several. It takes several diversions into full on comedy sketches. At one point, he gets surgery performed on him. And there is also a musical sequence. Okay. So it's like, it is, it's gone insane. Uh, I, I tweet about it during the week and I just said, Bobby Fingers is the best YouTube channel you've never heard of. Um, for people who are Irish listening to this, if you close your eyes, it sounds like Blind Boy speaking. I know he's from Limerick. Yes, but that you, kind d- of- d- d- this is... This is what you were saying. You you were saying if you didn't know any better, you would say this was actually Blind Boy. Yeah. It's some guy, like, definitely this guy is connected in, like, the performing arts in Ireland somehow. But it's not it's not actual Blind Boy. Yeah. Because um, you do see this guy's face in this. 
um for the first time in this episode but it's uh yeah you gotta check it out i would say watch all the episodes from the beginning because they could understand how crazy the jeff bezos rowing boat one is by comparison but they're all great they're all really good um that's body fingers uh lee we wanted to make one little shout out that i might give you the office to do and that's regarding um our pre pre shows we normally do them for the big four aew shows but them adding pay-per-views has kind of complicated things but we had an idea instead of doing a full gear one at short notice that we might do something a little different yeah so initially we had planned on doing a full gear show this this weekend but because obviously the week has been so hectic and we're, we're literally only recording this like 24 hours before full gear actually takes place um instead we are going to do a world's end pre-pre-show which will also tie in with our kind of christmas special we did like a live stream last year around christmas time so we'll tie this in as like our year end slash world's end um kind of pre-pre-show and uh, that that's the plan for for going forward for the live shows for the moment yeah so what we might do is create a post on the patreon where we start collecting questions because part of our Christmas special last year was to include uh, a Q and A portion of proceedings. Mm-hmm. So we might we might drop that soon. So the questions are accumulating um, over the month. So if you're a member at a large man appears dot com, your question if you if you put it in beforehand, we will guarantee to answer it. And then you know whoever's in the live chat, the link to these pre shows is always posted free on our social media. Um, so we will try to get to all the chat on it, but the one thing we will guarantee is that all questions that are sent to us via Patreon will be answered. Yep. Um, Sounds yeah, good. Yeah, it, sh- it should be a good festive time, I would imagine. Um, I'm hoping that World's End has a-, a couple of bangers on it because Lord knows me staying up very late the night before New Year's Eve had better be fucking worth it. That's all well, I'll say, TK. I'll, uh, I'd rather stay up the night before New Year's Eve than New Year's Eve itself, so... God, yeah, you're you're not New Year's guy either, No, I fucking hate New Year's Eve. The only thing I like about New Year's is that New Year's Day is me and Emma's anniversary, so that has added, like, some level of interest to it, uh, but I don't like the whole New Year's palaver. And one of the things I hate about it is that when I have New Year's with my family, they refuse to watch any of the English TV stations for the countdown. So you can't watch the- Jewel Holland. That's the one thing I want to watch because Jules Holland always like has one or two great bands on the New Year's show. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by uh, the fact that you and Emma have your anniversary on New Year's Day. Yeah. Did, yeah. did the two of you just decide, well, it's a new year, I better get somebody to fucking spend the rest well, of my life with. So there was like over <laughs> December, or the December before we'd met each other a couple of times and there had been, you know, overtures, shall we say, that we might be interested in one another and uh basically you know new year's countdown happened we did the the stereotypically cringy thing of the new year's kiss and then i got up the nerve to officially ask her out properly when we were walking home um so uh some would say that i did that so that it is literally impossible for me to forget my anniversary (laughs) because it's the first of the first uh happy coincidence i actually would have uh, i've always maintained i would have asked her out sooner over the christmas period but i spent most of that christmas period minding my uncle's house out in like the the back arse of beyond in south kildare so i wasn't actually in or around our social circles at all over that period of time and new year's was kind of like the one chance um yeah just funny how these things come about i think Mm -hmm. um right Lee, we got to get into this these wrestling shows. We do. We got to think. Firstly, we got to think of an order that we want to do them in, and then we got to go and see what Uncle Dave had to say. I think we should do SmackDown first because the Thunder is fucking horrendous. Yeah, and there's very little to say about it. Yeah, it, it like it. Uh, honestly, before I realized, because I had watched Thunder before I realized we had to do SmackDown as well. Hmm. I did not know what we were going to spend even 45 minutes talking about yeah. when it came to Thunder. 
Uh, thankfully, Dave has plenty to tell us about this week in the Observer, so okay. I think that's our first port of call, really. So let's let's start with the Observer, and then we'll do SmackDown, and then we'll go yeah. to Thunder. So this is from the August thirtieth, nineteen ninety nine uh, Observer, which is the the most recent one after these shows take place. Um, and this is kind of like the post Summer Slam and final bits of feedback after Road Wild edition of the the Observer. Um, so he was talking about how at the house shows over the previous weekend, uh, a crisis at the top of the card with people not being around or not being fit um, has meant that they have had to blow off one of the big remaining dream matches um, of a sort uh, on house shows. And that is Hogan versus Hart for the world title. They called Brett back early. And had him work a series of three non-televised house show world title matches against Hulk Hogan. So it's so funny when you think of all the the WrestleMania 9 of it all. And, you know, they've had Brett for nearly two full years now. And they've never done the match. And this is how it finally happens. I think it's very WCW, isn't it? Oh, it's just such desperation. Like, I'm, I'm guessing the house show... Like, even Hogan working a house show in 99 sounds fucking ridiculous yeah. to me. The, uh, the original plan for the shows was to be headlined by Hogan and Sting versus Savage and Sid. Uh, and also a semi-main of Goldberg versus Flair. But we talk about the... Um, we talked last time. Well, Flair, Flair, Flair is Flair's, on the outs again. Flair is on the outs and at least saying his back is hurt mm. at the moment. Um, and then there are various things going on with uh, other people I have just mentioned, uh, including Savage, who I will is, is in the next little story here. You, you notice the booker that was uh, in a feud with Hogan wasn't working the house shows. Mm, interesting, isn't it? Mm. Um, so the situation with Savage isn't as easy to explain, um, says uh, Dave here. Uh, he does list that other people who were tentative replacements in those matches include Conan, who now has an injured neck, uh, Kurt Hennig, injured knee. Uh, they could only appear in the corners of Filthy Animals versus West Texas Rednecks match. Um, so they're they're kind of like, they're getting worried. Dave is kind of implying that WCW is getting worried that there has been, because of injuries and because of like, I guess people going into business for themselves, but he doesn't outright say that here. Um, they're really concerned that they're starting to burn house show audiences on advertising people who then don't appear. I mean, um, the, so this the, is something they're worried about. That's a WCW problem going back to the late eighties was yeah. advertising matches on house shows and people just not going. Mm-hmm. So but anyway, the situation with Savage isn't as easy to explain. Savage blew up at WCW after the Road Wild pay-per-view show, claiming that Hogan was trying to sabotage his career. He then missed the 816 Nitro, although few fans actually noticed. His basic claim was that it was Hogan who made the call to drop the Humvee driver angle, remember that, which was dropped, then brought back, but then dropped again, and claimed Hogan had elevated Sid Vicious into his spot as the lead heel, Plus, all of their past love-hate relationship stuff going back nearly 15 years always comes up when Savage and Hogan have their problems. He basically refused to work the weekend house shows, although at one point he was in communication with WCW house show promoter Zane Bresloff, who he has a long-standing relationship with, but still refused to work the shows. With the two top stars no-showing and both main events destroyed, the original plan was for Hogan and Sting to face Vicious and Rick Steiner. And then Goldberg versus Meng in the semi-main. Instead, on 819, Bischoff called Hart up and told him he was starting back as a sub for Savage on the three weekend shows and that he'd be facing Hogan in singles matches. There was no advanced publicity of this match, which at least theoretically should have been something of a draw if it had been promoted in any of the three cities, none of which had strong advances going in despite advertised lineups featuring most of WCW's draws. It was really something for WCW to work so hard to give a more attractive main event than advertised due to internal problems. When WCW was riding high and selling out its house shows, and these problems were still taking place, they never went to this kind of effort to bring in subs, and eventually it was going to catch up to them. Now it has long since caught up with them, and they debuted a dream match at three house shows with no publicity and for shows that didn't even have good advances. So, like... Right there, that that explains 
the various problems in WCW. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah. Um, this is one that I, I wanted you to buckle in for that I told you about before we started. If the morale in WCW was bad, it's gotten worse after a botched up power play attempt by Eric Bischoff. Some people who are keen historians of the period may know about this. Bischoff called a meeting of the wrestlers before the Nitro on 823 in Las Vegas and began (laughs) singling out various wrestlers for public tongue lashings. He began by saying that he was going to turn things around and only wanted wrestlers in the company who wanted to be in the company. His first target was Scott Levy, Raven, who he yelled at for his remarks negative to the company publicly, in particular on the Man Cow radio show out of Chicago. We talked about that last week. He offered Raven a release and Raven walked out of the meeting. (laughs) So this is the famous... If anybody wants to leave the company, I will give them the release now. Yeah. And Raven got up and left and got out of the company. Yeah, arguably more people should have done the fucking same thing at this point. Mm-hmm. Target number two was Charles Ashenoff. Do you know who that is? Yeah, that's K Dog. That's, that's Mr. 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 Have you listened to my podcast? Yeah. Uh, who, who he yelled at for going over the PA in Reno in response to the Cowboys cutting a promo with the comeback saying something to the effect of, you guys look like you haven't had any pussy since pussy had you. Oh, Jesus Christ. Bischoff asked Conan how can a parent in the audience explain the word pussy to their six-year-old and Conan apologized. He then offered Conan and anyone else who wanted one a release. Conan didn't walk out at that moment. But it's very funny that Conan was one of the ones trying to jump ship then mm-hmm. with, the, with the Radicals. Um, Bischoff apparently felt that the wrestlers, despite their complaints, many of them very public, when faced with the decision, wouldn't opt to walk out on their big money guaranteed contracts. Bischoff then w- went after Oscar Gutierrez, who is... That's uh, one Rey Mysterio. That is one Raymond Stereo. For his remark on Thunder, before the Lenny Lane title switch... Uh, which this was edit this I'm pretty sure was edited out of Thunder or I completely suppressed it because it's a horrifying thing. Uh, he apparently on Thunder said to Lenny Lane if he was going down the Hershey Highway. I think he did say. It. Oh, I don't remember. Oh, I must have suppressed it. Um, he followed by yelling at Marcus Bagrell for his crybaby behavior that led to the fight with Ernest Miller before the show in Sturgis. And then he yelled at public enemy because they complained so loudly about being asked to do a squash job in a handicap match to Sid for Thunder. Um, more of which later. Uh, public enemy apparently gave their notice that night after being asked to put Sid over. A few weeks earlier, they were asked to put Goldberg over in a handicap match, but it was changed at the last minute to a singles match with Rocco versus Goldberg. It's so funny that the public enemy are like, no, no, no. We're not putting Sid over. Fucking public like, enemy. Public enemy Fuck in off. 1999. There are people in the company sympathetic to Bischoff for having to lay down the law because the ta- talent as a group has gotten completely out of control. The feeling is that it would have been better served if he did so individually rather than embarrass them in front of everybody. In addition, he came off looking badly to everyone with him making statements, daring people to leave, then having to backtrack when he was taken up on the dare. (gasps) Others were complaining that Bischoff went after mid-carders who were vocal and complaining publicly uh, in Conan and Raven, but didn't go after the big stars like Sting, who was also critical of the company in high-profile media outlets, or Randy Savage, who walked out and missed the last eight days after doing questionable angles on his own without the approval of the company, the girlfriend. (laughs) Abuse I was just going to say, like, hitting your fucking gear friend, like... Yeah, and repeatedly using questionable language on television, making Bischoff look stupid since he publicly has tried to portray WCW as the clean company as opposed to WWF. This has caused some of the company to believe that Hogan, Savage, and Bischoff are working some sort of angle on everybody else, which probably isn't the case, but that shows just how strong the level of paranoia internally has gotten because of all the lame attempts at swerving the employees and wrestlers over the past years. In fact, the level of paranoia is such that there were even some who thought this situation was an angle designed by Bischoff because he has so publicly dressed down the guys, just as many thought the Ric Flair lawsuit was an angle, which it and this both weren't. <laughs> See, Tony Khan, this is what happens when you work the boys. Yeah. 
fucking When hell. Levy went to WCW lawyer Scott Wilkerson about getting his release, Wilkerson brought up a 90-day non-compete clause, which Levy noted Bischoff had said nothing about. In a later conversation, Bischoff told Levy he'd release him to go to ECW, but that it would be a conditional release that wouldn't let him go to WWF for the remainder of his contract, which has about 10 months left on it. Levy brought up that Bischoff made no such restrictions at the meeting. He also told Gruner um, that he didn't give him two years of television time to allow him to walk over to the WWF. But a few hours later, Bischoff changed his tune again when confronting Gruner at the bar uh, and told him he could have a full release. That's Billy Kidman, by the way. Pete Gruner. (laughs) I've never heard his real name. Yeah, me either. Um... So it is believed by the next morning the story had changed once again. Taylor indicated to the wrestlers that he was interested in all of them, uh, but he had to get it cleared through Vince McMahon. Um, This is Terry Taylor, I'm assuming. Um, So there was obviously a group that went... So it would have been the Filthy Animals. I think it was was, the Filthy Animals as a group, wasn't it? it? it It was Raven, Conan, Ray, and Billy Kidman. All asked for releases that night. Was it not Ed, did Eddie not ask as well? Uh, no, because he... I mean, he mightn't have been at that TV. I don't know. Uh, the only ones listed in the Observer okay. are those guys. Um, and there were calls made to Terry Taylor in WWF and Paul Heyman. Raven was the only one of them interested in ECW, obviously. Um... McMahon apparently told Terry Taylor that due to the lawsuits back and forth and potential tampering changes he wouldn't need to enter into negotiations with any talent until after Bischoff gave them a full written release Bischoff later asked Levy what would it take to stay and Levy said uh, he wanted to be one of the top 10 guys in the company and noted that none of the top 10 guys would ever put the younger talent over Um, that's mad yeah, that's, that, like, that, yeah. that the talent were aware that they were never going to get put over just says it all yeah like that's a good way of going this is what you have to do something that i know you will never do Mm -hmm. even though like in terms of like how much the product was built around them for the first like year year and a half or so of us watching thunder like he deserved to be one of the top earners in the company not necessarily a top earner but treated as a top guy like yeah yeah anyway yeah uh this is one that'll tickle you um, there is literally no plan at the moment for the Fall, Bo- fall Brawl pay-per-view, which is in three weeks. There's literally no plan. WCW, WCW was supposed to record its first pay-per-view channel promotional piece for the show this past week, but cancelled filming because nothing has been decided for the pay-per-view. Jesus Christ. Uh, they had planned... Um, Oh yeah, so they talked about he talked about on Nitro Kiss played in concert. People switched stations as quick as they could to get off their couches, and all the suspense was answered when Brian Adams was introduced as the Kiss Warrior. Um, originally, a Shane Douglas pla- planned turn was supposed to happen in Sturgis. He had been with the Revolution for like what three weeks? Two or three weeks, yeah, max. And. Apparently, now we must have missed a lot of this uh, laying the groundwork, must have been on Nitro, because people saw it coming, so they decided to hold off on it indefinitely. They had already internally booked Douglas versus Malenko at most of the house shows in September. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Zane Breslov signed a new five-year deal with the, co- with the company. Uh... 816 Kevin Nash was doing uh, an autograph signing in Denver which is no big deal since he did it all the time however it was being advertised in Denver for several days before the pay-per-view which basically gave the finish of the match away to anyone with half a brain in that market (laughs) so it was being advertised on the day of a TV show when you were supposed to not know that Kevin Nash was going to be off TV because of a retirement stip so everyone in Denver knew (laughs) the finish of the pay-per-view main event to be fair, I think everyone knew the finish of the pay-per-view main event. There was no way fucking Hogan was retiring. During midweek, there was a ton of talk about Bischoff's position being uh, tenuous, but at this point, the storm seems to have completely blown over again within the office and among the wrestlers because Turner is a company. Uh, there have been 
diversity meetings uh, as it regards race relations. Things were okay in the office until the No Limit Soldiers versus Cowboys angle because the office is basically made up of country music fans and African Americans and the angle somehow polarized the office personnel. Two weeks ago, one of Bischoff's secretaries wrote a very nasty racial joke on her computer and emailed it to some of her friends, but apparently either pushed the wrong button and emailed it to everyone, both black and white, in the office by accident or somehow everyone in the office had read the joke. When she wasn't fired for the joke, there were a lot of complaints about how racial harmony was made out to be such a big thing in the company and by not firing the secretary, it sent a powerful message. WCW and racism, hand in hand. Yeah, that's something that doesn't go away. Yeah. Uh, Roddy Piper is currently doing a movie in Canada. Uh, Bret Hart is currently uh, appearing in Esso uh, gas station commercials with Wayne Gretzky. Um... One to watch here. Robbie Kellum will be coming in as a piano player doing a Liberace gimmick. Um, okay. Apparently, more details about the Buff Bagwell, Ernest Miller incident. One of the reasons Bagwell got mad is because they wouldn't let him use the blockbuster in the match. And apparently that complaining worked because in their rematch on Nitro, he won with the blockbuster. Um, nothing new on Flair. Internally, there's a lot of talk that he's finished with the company, but uh, everything is in flux. Um Nicola Roberts, who is a very well-known valet, as who in the mid eighties, Lee? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Nicola Roberts was that? Oh, um, Rock and Robin. As Baby Doll. Oh, Baby Doll. Oh, okay. Uh, she w- lives in Lubbock, so she was backstage at the tapings. Oh, okay. Chavo Guerrero Senior was at the Las Vegas show trying to get a job. <laughs> he wouldn't get a job until what two thousand and four, two thousand three. Mm. Uh, Savage's contract expires at the end of the year. Um, apparently, the Deadpool name didn't come from Raven Ribbing based on things people were saying about him. Um, yeah, there's a new scriptwriter backstage, and that's about it from. Oh, here's an in. Oh, here's an incredible thing, by the way. Um, do you know? You remember they were promoing First Daughter, co-starring DD. Oh yes, yes. Do you know what that did in the rating? Oh, God. Go on, tell me. 6.9. No. Over the last 12 years, only 27 movies in the history of Basic Cable has ever drawn a 6.0 or better. It was the most watched television show of any kind in the history of TBS. Jesus Christ. (laughs) That's insane. That yeah. is insane. Yeah. Uh, some notes on Miss Madness Mona. Her real name is Nora Greenwald, although her wrestling name at the moment is Starla Saxton. Uh, okay. She's only 21 at this time, which I didn't know. Uh, as is evident from some of her moves, she was captain of her high school gymnastics teams that won the state championship in her senior year, and she competed from the age of 14 as a powerlifter, which I didn't know about her. Jesus, 14 as a powerlifter. Yeah. Fair play to her. Um, but it's uh, it's it's very, very newsworthy week in terms of like that Bischoff meeting in particular is. Uh, oh, it's, it's infamous. It's, it's infamous. fucking brilliant. I I lo- I genuinely love that story of Raven going. Yeah, I want my release. <laughs> yeah. And then like basically they were like, oh no, no, we didn't mean really. And then he just moaned so much they ultimately gave it to him. Yeah great stuff yeah um and it, like this is just the start of conan trying to politic his way out with any group of people that are leaving the, the, like he tries to go with this crew of people to sneak into wwf and then yeah he, he tries, tries to go, to go with, to with the radicals. The radicals yeah um yeah nobody wanted conan with them yeah next time it is an even harder sell because the radicals are trying to sneak in him and shane douglas <laughs> That guy, like, that guy gets fucked over. Like you know, I'm not the biggest Shane Douglas fan around, but he gets fucked over so hard by the radicals. It's great. Yeah, he really does. <laughs> he really, they leave him in the fucking dirt. Uh, right. So we're going SmackDown first, are we? Yeah, I think SmackDown. It's more. It's more not worthy. So this is the UPN debut of SmackDown. Technically, the second episode. We we covered the pilot some months ago. 
This is from Kansas City, Missouri, in the Kemper Arena. And I am kind of perturbed by the fact that they're back at the Kemper oh, Arena. Shit. And Owen Hart is not mentioned once on this show. I Just as you said Kemper Arena, I was like, oh my fucking God. It's literally only... Yeah. Like, it's like, it's two what, months? six months? No. No, it's not. It's not even. It's like two or three months, too. Yeah, this is their, but this is their first time back, and it's not that long. Um, and they don't mention him once, which I found like really offside. Oh, okay. Um, I was gonna say I listened to, I went and and downloaded the Bruce Pritchard uh, episode about the first SmackDown. Oh yeah, because it was pre his return to WWF, like in our so WWE. He was actually, so he was actually you know informative. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the few little bits. Um. Yeah, this, the deal with UPN actually came about because they were shopping the XFL. Ah. So, obviously, they were shopping the XFL around to the networks, and CW was owned, or sorry, UPN was owned by uh, CBS at the time, Viacom. Hmm. And they were like, oh, we might have an interest in the WWF and putting on broadcast. And that was, that was the big thing. Yeah. Uh, UPN, which is now the CW, um, yeah. is a broadcast channel. So anyone with a basically an antenna can pick up UPN. So obviously, I feel like I'm going to turn into Lanza here when he was talking about the the CW on the flagship, where he's like, "If you have a TV, yes. you can get this channel." Um, but here's the, here's a, a thing that I never realized: there was internal talks. Of making a divas show, a one-hour divas yeah. show. At the time, there was that. Wasn't there? Was it around now, or was it when the deal was up that there was also talk of like a, like a luchador themed show? Oh well, Super Astros was n- yeah ninety eight. I think wasn't it? They did the the mm. pilot that never aired. Yeah. Um, but then they stopped. Yeah, so it was they, just before this. They yeah. stopped caring about you know the like heavyweight division very quickly. Yeah. Um. Mm. The other thing, because this was broadcast and Raw was cable, yeah, there was discussions of making SmackDown the A show. Yeah, and for a while, it's interesting. Like I was watching this with Emma, and she was just like, "I do not remember SmackDown being this loaded." And I was like, "Well, it is the first one, but also like there is that little while where these shows are stacked." Well, see, this is what Bruce says throughout the show. He's like, you know, Vince's whole thing was. Yeah, we're taking on two extra hours, and yo, know, you know, SmackDown is the reason Russo left, um, because yeah. he didn't want extra work. But Vince's whole thing was, well, we work till midnight every night anyway, so what's the extra work you're talking about? Um, and that basically he said, we now have this show, but Raw can't suffer, and it, it wasn't the case of one is more important than the other. It was, I want Austin, I want Mankind, I want Triple H, Undertaker on all like on the shows and that's just the way it is yeah so yeah now just a few few little uh, tidbits I picked up from from listening to the the Pritchard show when it was actually useful at the time yeah interesting uh, do you want to hear some of the dark matches that were on this show go for so we had Kurt Angle who is debuting Survivor imminently series. I think he's, he's Survivor Series yeah. yeah so two and a half months away uh, he wrestled the California Kid uh, Matt Hardy with Jeff Hardy versus Edge with Christian. Okay. Uh, Hardcore Holly with Crash versus D'Lo. Uh, non-title match Mark Henry versus Val Venus. And Gangrel versus Chaz with Mariana. Oh, Mariana was with Chaz at this point. Mm-hmm. Okay, because that's a, that's something they bring up during the show is that they had talked about splitting up the headbangers. Yeah. Um, and Chaz would go on to become... Uh, the Leave of the Beaver character what was um, Beaver Cleavage Beaver Cleavage yes, yes. Um, and do you know what the plan for Trasher was can't remember I know the, I, I, you, as soon as you say it I'm going to remember they were going to bring him back in a clown gimmick yeah with Bruce as his manager yeah apparently Bruce had dyed his hair black and had like a black goatee and they were going to have uh, what was it he said it was going to be? Oh, it was something like the 
the Doink Corporation or something like that. It was like, you know, it was going to be like a hidden reference to Doink, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because in 99, we were really crying out for that. So Bruce was like, oh, you know, Glenn, we always thought Glenn Root was a great guy and he could, uh, he could live up to Matt Bourne as like the clown character. It's like, no, he fucking couldn't. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Anyway, so just a few little bits. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, let's get into the actual show. And we have basically a catch-up vignette to start us because one thing that I had forgotten about the, the network debut of SmackDown is that is the kickoff of the Triple H era. See, this is when he started yeah. referring to himself as the gamer. The gamer. Uh, is it like, is, the start is of it, the era of the 20-minute promos. It's promo at the start and everything is elongated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like there's the famous apocryphal story about this title switch essentially happens because Steve Austin's like lose to who <laughs> okay we need to explain this yeah go for it Austin wasn't the easiest to do business with at this point no we we had alluded to we mentioned in the Zero coverage on the last episode that very recently he had publicly said he wasn't going to work not even lose he wasn't going to work with Jeff Jarrett or Billy Gunn okay um yeah so Russo had spent two years pushing for Austin to do a program with Jarrett and Austin yeah. just repeatedly shot it down no matter how hot Jarrett got with the you know the undercard act he just wasn't having it um Billy Gunn won the King of the Ring obviously um, yeah. had just worked with The Rock at SummerSlam and Austin again having none of it so Austin wasn't the easiest like he was basically he'd run through the top of the card there was nobody else for him to work with and the plan obviously over the summer the begin- from the beginning of the summer on really was to elevate Triple H he went over The Rock clean a couple of times I think at the yeah. beginning of the summer definitely a fully loaded and I want to say somewhere else as well. He was linked at the hip with Shane for basically the whole second, like, part, for basically the whole summer. Um, and they really did their best to elevate him. Like, he became the guy in the corporation while Undertaker led the ministry. And, um, well, that was the, the corporate ministry was the thing for a while. So, but yeah, no, the, the whole idea was to elevate Triple H as somebody for Austin to work with. So then we get to SummerSlam, and Austin is definitely not 100%. Yeah. And the plan was for Austin to drop the belt to Triple H. And I think they wanted to do a clean finish. And Austin was like, uh uh-uh, uh, not going to happen. Then it very quickly became, well, no, I'm not dropping it to Triple H at all. So they had to rush Foley back. We, like we said, he was supposed to be out, what, three or four months, wasn't he? Yeah. Did, like, the list of injuries he had was like, horrendous and they basically rushed him back after three weeks to get involved in the whole SummerSlam build and they did the triple threat match at SummerSlam Mankind won the title at SummerSlam and they did a show long angle basically to build uh, Mankind versus Triple H the next night on Raw and Triple H be Foley for the title yeah we should say that Triple H took out Austin after SummerSlam um, after the match ended, he, he attacked Austin with a chair, yeah. and they, that was his right off for basically a month. Or he, so he obliterated his knee, yeah. and then like for the next while, while he's off TV, the thing is, I cripple the rattlesnake. Yeah. Stone Cold's never going to be the same again. Um, but even when he comes back, like he's only back, and then he's gone again, right? Like <laughs> he gets fucking hit by a car. <laughs> Actually, it's fucking true story. Austin got hit, run over by a car. At an airport, uh, it was either the week before this or the week before the yeah. April. Remember the the four show? Yeah, Austin legit got run over by a car. Do you think like while he's mid air, he's like, "God damn, I got an idea, kid." <laughs> I think he held that one in the back pocket. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, he legit got hit by a car and bounced up over it, like. And uh, Bru- Bru- I got an idea, and it's going to end with the big show as WWF champion. Bruce apparently said no, it was total coincidence, but uh, you know, I don't know about that. There are no coincidences. Um, but yeah, so basically, Triple H big push starts now. Yeah, and this is like the thing as well, and we've mentioned it maybe once or twice in the show 
that people forget because of the Triple H he is now and because of the 20 minute promo. Between the summer of 99 and when his quad explodes uh, just before the invasion, Triple H fucking ruled. Oh, he was very, like, he really, legit was very good. He uh, genuinely. I don't know if there was a better top of the card wrestler in North America in 2000. I can't think of somebody who I'd have a more compelling case for. No, the on- the only one that would come close, the only two that would come close would be Jericho and Bema, but they weren't top of the card consistently. Yeah. Like, you could argue in terms of star power, The Rock is higher, mm. but, like, Triple H was ten times the wrestler yeah. at the time. Angle, as good as he was. Yeah, well, I mean, Angle gets elevated very quickly. So, yeah, it's by, what, the end of, close to the end of the year where he's top of the card? Yeah. Um, But, yeah, like, is that, like, I mean, I loved that Rock-Triple H feud. But in, just in, passing the title in, back and forth. In 2000. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, of course, the Foley feud to kick off the mm-hmm. year, which really, like, as much as they're trying with him towards the end of 99 and they do, like, the dastardly, the Steph angle is coming up soon and, you know, him and um, but like, Vince at Armageddon, but it's the, it's the Foley feud that, much like with Sean, it's the Foley feud that solidifies. It's like, this is the guy. But, I mean, th- listen to the list you just rattled off there. Uh, he takes out Austin. He yeah. beats Vince. He puts Foley into he retirement. Had already be- he had already beaten The Rock, as you mentioned. Yeah, he put Foley into retirement. He's the first heel to win at WrestleMania, like retain the title. Yeah. He beats Rock again on pay-per-view in the April, I think. Then drops the title in May. Yeah, he so The Rock beats him for the title at Backlash with Steve Austin's assistance. Oh, it's the Backlash where he drops it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so then he Triple H wins it back at Judgment Day. Is it the Iron Man match where he wins it back, or did he already have it back by then? I think he already had it back because Judgment Day is the kind of fuck finish with Taker coming out. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so he already had the belt. So by he then. must have won it on a Raw. Um, and yeah, then he wins it back, and they do like he beats. Like he has the dust, the famous dusty finish with Jericho. Yes, is at some point in like March, April. Um, then they do the kind of the McMahon's versus the, the baby faces feud first King of the Ring, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The six man tag. Um, was that the one that was branded as the six pack challenge? No, the six pack challenge was the Helen Cell match. Oh, that, was, later in the that, year. Was, that was the other deal, yeah. yeah um, I'm trying to think then, what did he do? SummerSlam 2000. Uh, is that him and Kurt? Oh, that's the triple threat match. First, the, 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 the love triangle, yeah. the brief love triangle. That's the, the where, triple threat match, yeah, where Kurt gets fucked Kurt up. gets fucked up on a pedigree on the announce table. Um. And then they drop that angle like a fucking hot, mm-hmm. hot rock. It, like. Insecure Triple H was having none of it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, hey guys, booking Stefan and Angle with her last fiancé didn't end well for the old fiancé. I'm not having this shit happen to me. <laughs> um, not sure what that says about Steph. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, know what, I know what it says he's saying about <laughs> Steph. Uh, and then the rest of 2000 is Austin. So, like, yeah. it's a fucking killer year. Austin comes back and kills him in his car at Survivor Series. Oh, he also reforms DX at some point in 2000 as well. He does, because uh, the DX Express gets famously destroyed mm-hmm. on SmackDown. Like, um, he, he lived- Survivor Series 2000, by the way, we all know very well as the Undertaker snakeskin pants <laughs> pay-per-view. <laughs> you know it as the snakeskin sp- pants uh I'll never stop. Th- it's been 13 years and I'll never stop thinking about those snakeskin pants, I, man. I prefer thinking about Eric Angle for that match, bro. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a legit killer 2000 for Triple H. Speaking of killer, the SmackDown set is in place now. It's so good. I love the first two iterations of the SmackDown set. The hoop set 
and uh, the the fist through the glass. Mm-hmm. As uh, Brian Danielson once said, SmackDown was really into fisting. <laughs> Daniel Bryan gets away with so much. I mean, that that's another <laughs> fucking time. Um, I feel like there's money in us doing a Patreon uh, talking smack rewatch podcast. <laughs> yeah, let's fucking just imagine what you'd find. Um, yeah. Did you see the update today? I think it was today in the Observer. Endeavor are like. Yeah, why the fuck are we bringing these expensive sets everywhere? Let's just have an entrance. So the lavish entrance sets for WWE could be a thing in the past. Oh, it's going to be like UFC now, where they just walk out from mm-hmm. just like the gap in between the stands. Yeah. So the is it the Raw after WrestleMania? Yeah. In it's Philadelphia next year, right? Isn't it? Yeah. So apparently the last couple of times they've been there, it's been set up for 13,000. Yeah. And they were like, no, but there's a shit ton of wrestling fans in the area. No entrance yeah. set. So now it's set up for 18,000. I feel like that in a long term sense, fundly, fundamentally misunderstands what people love about wrestling. Like spectacle is a huge percentage mm-hmm. of it. And one of the things that disenchanted me with the WWE product was when they stopped having unique sets all the time yes like remember the whole thing of like remember the pyro went missing for like four years yeah and then they brought the pyro i didn't mind as much as the sets but it became such a thing of they won't even spend money as like for entrances which is such a big thing for that company specifically yeah. Yeah, um, and like AEW don't pot commit like they still do like in terms of thinking creatively about how to change up the equipment they already have I think they do a good job but even they don't commit like WWF like I'm sure the budgets were outrageous but like seared into my memory are like the backlash swinging blades the king the, of the ring chair the king of the ring electric chair just the gigantic summer slam like Double oval S. screen on top yeah. of the S um loads of these like the armageddon set where it was just like burnt out cars and shit mm-hmm. um the red phone the wrestlemania boxes. like <laughs> and it's still one of the only cool things left about wrestlemania every year is getting to see the set reveal yeah it, it, it's such uh, a good oh thing. the royal rumble 2000 with the taxi cab hanging over mm-hmm. and uh the 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 kind of the 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 entrance like uh like Fuck, like I could talk, we could talk for ages about it, but we do eventually have to talk about SmackDown, I think. Yeah, they opened a bit of a nice little video on Triple H. How about that? <laughs> yeah, nice little video. Uh, we got the SmackDown set. JR and King are on the call. Fucking Cornette's been fucking yeeted out. <laughs> okay, now it's for real. We need the actual commentators. No Michael Cole, no Jim Cornette. Um, Triple H is out to start with his promo, and it's basically just a bragging uh, promo. Uh, about how great he is and about how it's so funny that he's talking about all the corporate honchos who said he couldn't do it which is obviously like wink wink nod nod curtain call punishment Mm -hmm. um but like uh, if you hadn't watched raw and didn't know like within a couple of seconds it becomes apparent to you that currently shane mcmahon is the storyline owner of the company and he helped triple h win the title (laughs) so it's like you're talking about all the corporate honchos who said you couldn't do it but the guy who owns the company literally helped you win i was like that made little to no sense to oh me. yeah because this is but, the period where vince is gone right yes what one of the periods this was he goes now and then he goes a little bit in 2000 to be the genetic jackhammer because wasn't this austin b undertaker yeah and one of the steps was if austin won vince was gone right Mm-hmm. yeah okay because we'd had a lot of who owns or who's in charge mm. in WWF over the last year or so. And this was apparently the final end to it. Uh, at the end of an era, match, that's wasn't. what it was. That's what they called it. Yeah. Um, can I just say, at risk of causing another segue without even getting through the first segment, how fucking good is that big blue belt, man? It, you know what? That's the, it looks good that's on the belt... H. That is the belt of a heavyweight wrestling champion. It, it, it does look good on Triple H, I'll give him that. that I mean, yeah. that's the belt I think of when I think Triple H and Rock. Yeah. 
I love that belt so much. Like, obviously, the Winged Eagle is fucking class, and the Undisputed title is fucking class. But I always have such a soft spot for Big Blue. Because I think it wasn't my belt when I started getting into wrestling, because it was Winged Eagle. But it was maybe the belt of the time where I was most just, like, starstruck by the product. Mm -hmm. Where I felt like every show was completely unmissable. Like I've often said before, like I was down to the fact that I was a weekly shotgun and metal viewer because I could not get enough WWF. This was my belt. Um, yeah, it's just I I love Big Blue and it fucking that that is a shiny ass belt as well. <laughs> um, but anyway, he says uh, it doesn't matter who you put in front of him. He calls the Rock the people's ass, which causes the Rock to come out. He says, if you are truly the game, then I say the game absolutely sucks. Rock says, tonight in the middle of the ring, he's going to beat him and become WWF champ. Um, There's only two things you can do about it. Nothing and like it. Uh, Triple H says, to play the game, you got to be in my league. So get lost because you're not. Um, And I, I text you when I was watching this segment. And between the leaner look, the shirt, and some of his affectations, and the sockless loafers, I was like... This is where I see the Rock Ricky Starks comparison the most. Mm -hmm. As I said, Um, this is like it's a very specific era of the Rock that Ricky pulled from, and this is this is that era. Yeah, yeah. Because even I would say by the by like mid two thousand, the Rock is has moved on much more in terms of his appearance. Like he's full on wearing his own merch at that point. Yeah, he's wearing like, yeah, because he's not with the eight hundred dollar shirts mm-hmm. and the was it the six hundred dollar shoes as he talks about in this. He uh, threatens to stick the shoes up his candy ass. At which point, HBK comes out. HBK was just constantly on TV over this couple of months period of time. People have, and then he yeah, just people have this impression that Shawn Michaels left after WrestleMania fourteen and just was gone. Yeah. He wasn't. He yeah. was on the show a lot. Yeah. Now he disappears. Like I think right after this for a little while because he does the what happens in the main event happens and there's never really a payoff to it Mm -hmm. because I think everyone assumed after this main event is like oh they're doing Sean versus The Rock because there was a couple of times in 99 and 2000 where there was hey Sean you want to come back Uh, before he completely gets pilled out of his head Um, and there's a big falling out after Judgment Day yeah isn't it is it isn't the night after Judgment Day, where he gets sent home, yeah, it's the yeah he tri- shows tri- up completely fucking yeah, wasted. Triple H is the one that like basically said he can't be here. Yeah, and the two of them like Don't talk. didn't talk yeah, for, for a, a long year, time, like year, year and a half. Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, he says he's going to make it official for tonight and insert himself as the special guest referee as he dances off. Shane then materializes already in the ring. I don't know where the fuck he came from. He reminds people he's currently owner of the WWF and says he's appointing himself as the second special guest referee. Sean says, ah, 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 because you're going to be busy tonight. He says he points out that because Shane wrestled at SummerSlam, uh, he is now a WWF superstar as well. So he gets to book him in matches, which means tonight it is Shane versus Mankind. Uh, I love this brought out Foley and I loved his twist on the... uh, Uh, Him doing his rock impression because Rock had talked about his $800 shirt or $600 shoes and he goes I'm gonna unbutton my $3 Salvation Army shirt <laughs> undo this tie that I got for free from the WWF and, <laughs> and he, he does the, the dozens, dozens and dozens but this is obviously yeah. like one of the first times because the fans haven't caught on yet yeah it's, it's a great bit yeah. My other favorite bit from this period of time in WWF is the Mean Street Posse being killed. I fucking love it. They come out it's still with the casts on. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pete Gas is in a huge boot. Rodney has his entire arm in a cast. And Joey has the neck brace. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's, I love the Posse so much. Um, We get a card rundown from JR and the King. Uh, one thing I will say, it's worth looking, if you're watching this show, keeping an eye on the render they have of Farouk for the, the tag team match because he genuinely looks scared. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. Um, our first match is non-title. It's Jeff Jarrett with Deborah and Miss Kitty versus Mr. Ass. Um, 
The thing about this show, Lee, as we start talking about actual wrestling, is much like when we've covered other WWF shows, a lot of things happen, but very little of the things have anything to do with wrestling. A lot of these matches are either outright bad or just nothing happens and it ends after a minute. Like, up until the main event, I don't think a match goes, like, more than a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's all Billy to start this match before Deborah distracts with her foreign objects for the heat. (laughs) Um, JR is desperately trying to get Jared Enterprises over as a thing. He really is. He says it like four or five times. Uh, Jeff ducks a desperation clothesline, which causes Billy to spill out. Uh, We want puppies chance as China comes out. Very classy. Uh, 1999 crowds, you gotta love them. Uh, Now, here's the thing. Do you think China was actually trying to hit anyone with the guitar or were both of them supposed to duck? Because it very much looks like both of them were supposed to duck the guitar and she fucking murders Deborah with it. <laughs> I, I don't know. It looked fucking bad, whatever was supposed to happen. Either she wasn't supposed to hit either of them or she was supposed to hit Deborah and Deborah mid swing decides she didn't fancy taking it and tried to get out of the way. <laughs> All I can say is I wouldn't like to be the person that fucking nailed Miss Stone Cold Steve Austin in 1999. Yeah, I. I I thought you were going to say an equally true statement is I wouldn't like to be the person on the end of a full force guitar swing from China, even if it's a gimmick guitar. Yeah, that's true as well. Um, China is all over the show. Yeah. Also, her booking is very confusing. It is very confusing. And also, you can tell by the crowd reactions to China that... I, I, I mean, like, it's it's not a... I mean, it's not an overly controversial thing to say is that this company fucking blew it with her. Oh. It's like, they really had a star in this woman. Yeah. And they did not know what to do with her. I mean, she's still part of the main heel act with Triple H. Yeah. And they're rightfully trying to get her involved with the IC stuff. But the problem yeah. is that Jeff Jarrett is such a fucking prick <laughs> yeah. that he turns her face. And I don't know whether they're trying to get sympathy on Billy Gunn at this point by having him be fucked over by China. I don't know. Yeah. But they they don't tell a clear, coherent story at all. And they event, they eventually just kind of go away from Triple H to China without doing a split. I don't like. I don't think they actually do an official mm. split, do they? No, they don't. They just like are not on TV together anymore. Uh, is it when she goes out injured that they kind of just? They just never like. There's no blow. There's, there's no blowback on Jared for like attacking Triple H's friend, valet, yeah, bodyguard, like whatever she was to Triple yeah. H at that point. Yeah, and we're only like a month or two away from the the wedding angle, mm-hmm. and they're they're done at that stage. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so I can't remember if there ever was a thing. Yeah, it's odd. It feels like one of those WWF great things in as much as, like, do you remember the, the whole JBL character switch was just, like, one week Bradshaw shows up on TV with blonde hair talking about Wall Street? Yeah. And then, like, the next week he's full JBL. <laughs> uh, anyway. um, One thing I also wouldn't like to be on the end of is the amount of force and speed and venom that uh, China puts into low blows. She does a couple on this show where I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> Um, Billy rolls up Jeff. Billy then tries to moon China, and then she he she does the low blow. Borders him with the low blow, yeah. Absolutely creases him up. Uh, we then get to see one of the most infamous 1999 WWF angles: Al Snow pleading with Boss Man to return his dog Pepper. Things don't end well for Pepper. Things do not end well for Pepper. Um, and to think it would only be the second most memorable boss man angle this year um, because <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately the big show's daddy finally croaked I'll tell you the big show or the big boss man had a hell of a 1999 <laughs> he got hung in hell um, in a cell at Wrestlemania yeah the hell in a cell that they totally erased from memory and never bring up the fucking <laughs> yeah <laughs> was it they didn't do a cell for ages and then they just did not have it on its history. They just went, Sean, uh, 
John yep. Undertaker. They hadn't, Kane, they, had, they hadn't done what they hadn't done one since King of the Ring ninety eight yeah. up to WrestleMania uh, fifteen. It was so bad that they didn't do another one for a year, and they didn't mention it because they went Undertaker uh, Foley and then just jumped to mm. the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So he has he gets hung by Undertaker at WrestleMania. He has the feud with Al Snow, and then as you mentioned, the Big Show's daddy. Yeah, and then, then as a gift for getting through all that, he gets Bull Buchanan <laughs> as his deputy. Yeah, I mean, look, there was worse deputies he could have had. But a uh, shout out, by the way, to our friends and yours, uh, the Attitude Era podcast who had uh, a running segment when they were talking about this period of time in the boss man's career called Big Boss Man Behaving Badly, about, like, every month they were having to catch up on all the ways in which (laughs) boss man had been a cunt since the last (laughs) pay-per-view. And there's so much stuff you forget on the in-between shows. (laughs) Like, again, we all remember through GIFs, the uh, the image of him speeding away (laughs) with Big Show's father's casket and Big Show leaping on the casket. But not a lot of us remember him reading a full poem on live TV, burying the big show for being upset about his dead dad. <laughs> oh, God. I I love Ray. I know, he really commits to the bit of being an absolute prick for the next year or so. It, like That was a guy that was doing absolutely nothing in WCW. And he just yeah. he fucking just went with it. Look, he made the most of it. Oh, that's great. Uh, well, speaking of, make, anyway. speaking of making the most of things, we get a, a quick shot of Howard Finkel with Chris Jericho. Yeah, Jericho berating him as he's shining his shoes. Um, then we get Test pacing uh, out by the, the back entrance to the arena because he had uh, proposed marriage to Steph on Raw and had not got his answer yet. And she was set to arrive any minute now. I'm sure you came out of your seat at this next match the Acolytes versus Kane and X-Pac versus the champions, Big Show and Undertaker. Am I making this up or were Big Show and Undertaker called Big Evil? I know he called himself Big Evil when he was short hair, meanie Undertaker. Yeah. But I don't, I can't remember. I have tried so hard <laughs> to suppress everything about this period. Like, much as I have been on the, on the, of the opinion for many years and will not be moved from it that the Undertaker apart from a very brief window where he was having WWF's best match of the year every year at Wrestlemania he has been shite and involved in shite for almost his entire career he was a terrible wrestler for most of his career and most of his angles were somewhere in the range between embarrassing and bad yeah, look, I'm not going to argue that point with you. Um, I don't know. The best thing about this match was Kane's organ into the DX music. I fucking love that. That's so good. Yeah. Um, I had a soft spot for X Pac and Kane. That's such a good team. Um, also, the worst thing about this match, never mind that it's. Oh, yeah, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> so it's bad enough that we get Undertaker and, and uh, Big Show as a team. But then we get Undertaker on commentary for the whole match. Yeah. And Taker, literally, one of the first things he says is, I don't care if we win or lose. Yeah. <laughs> well, wait to bury the fucking titles, man. The other thing as well is, like, can we... Can we talk about how, like, this was one of the many periods during which they were blatantly punishing Big Show on TV by making him look like an ass? Like, the whole point of, like, even though he wins the match, the whole point of this Undertaker on commentary here is to slag off Tall Paul. Oh, yeah, he just braids him. Like the, the whole- And I'm particularly upset this week because I watched Big Show die on live <laughs> television this week. <laughs> I was trying to explain to Connor. Connor hadn't seen it. And I was trying to explain just... <laughs> the Paul White was killed, Connor. <laughs> just how badly... He bounced off that fucking car. It's so bad. <laughs> Did you? See? I don't know if it was in the Slack or it was on the Discord or something, but there was a great, uh, a great 
image uh, gift put up of uh, you know Jericho, Kent or Jericho Kota and Kenny celebrating in the ring, and all the while Big Show is just lying dead. It's the uh, you know the Homer falls down the cliff. Yeah, and it's just Big Show fucking lying. There. <laughs> fucking brilliant. Oh, that's funny. Um, that's funny. But yeah, just this whole era, like the whole reason they put Taker with him was so they could actually on screen berate him constantly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so bad. They're, and now, a, look, they're spending seven figures on this guy. And this is what they choose to do with him. I mean, no one made them give him that much money. Well, someone say Hulk Hogan did. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Don't forget, a WCW yeah. wouldn't know what to do with a giant. Yeah. <laughs> Just put the word right on it. Uh, anyway yeah yeah uh, um there's moment i like i don't want to talk about this match because it's shite like there's it, it a bit doesn't, where it's not stuck. long enough to even be shy yeah there's like there's a bit where he gets uh the show gets knocked out of the ring and you hear tigger go oh come on <laughs> he gets up and he slaps big show in the face like, do you want the knowledge um uh, he goes back in. He goes to Powerbomb X-Pac. And what's really funny is, as he goes to Powerbomb X-Pac, the reaction, like the shrieks in the crowd, that like, I don't think X-Pac's going to survive <laughs> this, is the way people are reacting. Well, see, X-Pac was very small. I don't know if you noticed. Yes. And uh, Big Show was, in fact, big. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, and tolerates very little BS, I've heard. I did like the one-handed choke slam on X-Pac. I always look good. Yes. Yeah. Oh, look, the, the show stopper choke slam is class. This was not a show nap. Yeah. Uh, this was not the choke nap. No. Um, the acolytes, so when he's up for the powerbomb, the acolytes come in and save X Pac for no reason at all. Well, they save him until they don't. Because Big Show um, boots all, him off his yeah. fucking shoulders. We also have maybe one of the biggest pops of the night for the cane clothesline. Yes, the flying cow. Now, I. I love the cane clothesline, but this was a disproportionate pop for what is not a great looking clothesline, technically speaking. I mean, look, it's 1999. Just getting to see at least two and a half minutes of a match. Yeah. One of the simplest things in wrestling that got over for, like, right up till he takes the mask off is, like, people will get into Kane's music hitting the pyro coming him coming out and just killing guys i don't know if you've ever seen like the amount of videos on youtube where like biggest wf returns and like, it's always the cane. Cane, like two or two or three cane yeah. returns that feature the one in particular i think of where he kills the whole the ex, regime yeah, yeah. where he comes back with paul yeah the, um, the cool black and red is, outfit instead of the red and black. Yeah, yeah yeah the reverse yeah. um the rare reverse cane um the yeah. other one is the, uh, un- pair of chokes. the I was just going to say the other one is the un-Americans one in 2002 yeah uh, pair of choke slams for the acolytes which look good uh, the big men start slugging each other Pac ducks a clothesline kicks Bradshaw on the outside and he walks back into the big ass showstopper uh, for the win Steph arrives what's very funny to me is that a young not comfortable on TV yet Steph constantly looks like she's stoned on these shows <laughs> I made note of when she comes out. But we get to it when she comes out later. So, yeah. Given that we are not that long away from her being like, you can't keep this woman off TV. It's so funny how uncomfortable she is at this point. She gets better very quickly. I'll give her that. Yes. Yes. No, she does. In fairness, I'm not saying that she remains bad, but she definitely like, I think given the choice at this time, probably wouldn't want to be on TV. And that very quickly changes. Um, WWF hardcore title match Al Snow the champion versus the big bossman um, they talk about Pepper again we go through a break and big boss man comes back out so boss man had come out to cut the promo Al Snow comes out to talk to him and we come back for the break and boss man comes out again and the thing I hated about this is that they actually use the dog yeah the dog like they, they literally make a point of saying the dog is shaking I, I'd fucking imagine so this tiny little dog was fucking terrified and he was holding it in place with the nightstick as he came out. And then I felt bad for poor Jerry Lawler and that is not something I would ever, ever usually say that he's basically responsible for this fucking terrified dog 
during this match where he's supposed to be doing his job on commentary while also comforting a fucking shaking dog. Um, Al tries to get up on the top rope with a ladder. Boss man knocks him down and the, the oh my God, the, the ladder does one of these like almost like a WWE 2K game glitch where it just like flicks up with a violent force that nearly kills the two mm-hmm. of them. It was like a real bad seesaw spot. Yeah, it was. It felt like we were like millimeters away from a Joey Mercury mm-hmm. happening to somebody. Uh, Al tries to go get Pepper, gets clubbed in the back with the nightstick, and Big Boss Man wins the hardcore title. Next up, we have, and I had forgotten this happens on this show, the wrestling debut of one Christopher Jericho. Well, you forgot that we get X Pac leaving and calling himself the weak link. So this is the beginning of that storyline yes. as well. Yeah. Um. So Chris Jericho versus the Road Dog. I don't feel like we should really spend long on this because this has been documented exhaustively in Jericho's book. Mm-hmm. It's a bad match. He hates it. He believes he has this tradition that every time he has a first match at a company, it's bad. Um. I mean, being put with Road Dog isn't going to help in that instance. Well, this is the thing: is like it is sloppy. Um, Look, the lo- the psychology of how it was agented doesn't make sense. But I don't think Jericho was bad in it. I think he was, he's made to look dumb because the finish involves him voluntarily DQing himself by putting Road Dog through a table in a match he was winning. Yeah, it's... Look, after the two Jericho promos where he got himself over and the boys in the locker room went, uh, no, we don't want you to get over... And they made, like, Bruce actually brings this up on his show. There was some that made a point of saying, no, we, we don't want this guy here. Yeah, And they were they were he, out to, like, prove that this guy was no good. To them, he had a WCW stink on him. Mm-hmm. Um, and because he was coming in alone, he was, unfortunately, didn't have people to back him up, like, when the Radicals came Whereas in. Whereas Vince should have went, uh, did you hear that fucking pop he got in Chicago? That's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, there was a lot of occasions where, like, people would jump or things would happen. Like, you hear about it during the invasion as well, which we'll document at some point, is that, like, this company were so paranoid because of the wars that they didn't realize if we work with these guys and make them look great, we'll all get over and make money. Mm-hmm. That there there actually was plenty of room and plenty of money for these guys as they were coming in. Um, but wrestlers can't see past their own noses. Um, and you know, when we get back to talking about WCW, it's ultimately what contributes to the death of that company is not being able to get out of your own way and put people over when it's right for everyone to do it. And yeah, this is just a small kind of case of it where no, we need to bury Jericho for a while because he's not our guy and he needs to pay his dues. Fuck that. Fuck that shit. Um, speaking of pain as Jews, what did you think of uh, so after after the Road Dog match we get a Jericho and the Fink in the back and for some reason the camera is lingering on Tony Chimmel. Just just camera yeah. lingering on Chimmel. Just no reason. You know the way a lot of T V shows had long, pointless close ups of Tony Chimmel. <laughs> and uh so we get Jericho riding up Fink saying, you know, that should be you, that's your spot. Mm-hmm. And Fink then enters to the Ultimate Warriors music. Yeah. I did laugh at that. And they It's so petty. You know, it's so petty. Ross and Lawler to their credit get off at least six warrior references. Um And it's a short segment, so that's yeah, that's they, impressive. They did well. And basically we have a Fink and Chimmel uh brawl. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Fink at least doesn't man like face to face, and then when he turns his back, Chimmel yeah. attacks him like the coward that he is. <laughs> Chimmel fucking whips his ass. <laughs> Look, he got to jump on him. What do you expect? It did. Um, so this leads to Jericho coming out to save Fink, and yeah. then we get Shamrock making his. See, this was the stuff I like when stuff bleeds into into each other, yeah. and. This is also, and I know we said it on the last Raw we covered, but I'm so shocked that in my head, I thought Shamrock was long gone from the company at this stage. It's kind of, they really stopped emphasizing him at this point. Yeah. Because yeah. He, uh, the thing with Shamrock was he kept missing house shows. 
yeah. and they just didn't trust him anymore. Um, yeah. But yeah, Jericho kind of shoulder checks Shamrock and runs away, basically. <laughs> mm. Well, he sends Fink after Shamrock and then Jericho runs away. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, uh, Ken gives chase and the heels leave. Uh, Steph comes out. Uh, I love Jerry Lawler's burial of Test as a very good second-rate wrestler. What, what is it um, with Stephanie and second-rate wrestlers? I don't know. Hey. Um, Tess comes out, proposes again. She accepts. The Mean Street Posse immediately attacks. I need to talk about, I think, one of my favorite big boots of all time. Test nearly punts Rodney's <laughs> head into the top <laughs> tier of this arena. You know what? Test was incredibly over in the summer of 1999. And I think it's just that he kept... Oh, sorry. It's later he does the boot. Yeah. This is where he spears Rodney and kills him. Um, it's, I think it's just that he repeatedly murdered the mean tree posse. <laughs> yeah, so like, good. they contributed so much to Tess getting over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to point out that Stephanie, at this point, you know, as you said, she's kind of on TV a lot. And she strolled out in her, her little sensible shoes. Like, she's just so far removed from what you think Stephanie. Um, yeah, she's not the billion dollar no, princess yet. Um, just totally different person. Yeah, you want to talk about somebody actually that made her character? Jericho. Well. When they start well. feuding, like, it does. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's, it's stuff that, like, absolutely would not fly now. But one of the things that absolutely got her over as a heel and started to get him over as a baby face was the two of them going at each other. Yeah. Um, When you think about it, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, So Mankind comes out to make the save. He helps murder the posse. Mankind says it's his second time out tonight and he's damn well not going to walk down the ramp a third time. So we're having our match now, Shane. Uh, and he said, I'm going to leave the chair here and you get one free shot. Uh, and he goes, while I do, I'm going to be hanging with the posse. <laughs> I love Big He's Bobby. so good. So fucking much. Um, I, th- I can't remember if I told you and if I said it on this podcast, but you got to check out his uh, episode of Hot Ones that came out a few weeks ago. Oh, I've seen it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I just, I, I cried at the, Mick, you got out of the to promote? No. <laughs> <laughs> That man's just happy living life. And it, you know what? Yeah. It's good. Yeah, I think someone said in reaction to the video, is like the fact that he is as lucid yes. and as mobile as he is and actually is able to remember stuff from his career on his podcast is nothing short of incredible. It's funny, when, when Terry Funk died a couple of weeks ago, one of my instant thoughts was, oh man, the mix not going to he's gonna take this badly yeah now i haven't seen haven't seen him recently or anything like i just i literally saw him i think on one of uh what's his daughter's name noel Noel. one of her like instagram stories or something yeah so he seems to be okay but yeah just like i can only imagine it's lee outing himself for following noel on instagram actually follow frank but whatever yeah okay (laughs) that's actually worse (laughs) and arguably creepier <laughs> no, I'm not thirsting over a, a young blonde woman. I'm actually following a weird pervert clown. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you, listen, you of all people know you gotta get down with the clown. <laughs> no, I don't know that. I don't know that at all. <laughs> don't you tear me with this? Singles match, Mankind versus Shane McMahon with the posse. Uh, Shane cracks Mankind in the back with a chair and declares himself the king of hardcore. That was brilliant. As Mankind, yeah, as Mankind gets up and kicks his ass, clotheslines him out of the ring and Shane's head bounces off the announce table on the way down. Um, Earl finally gets out to, to ref the match and Shane tries to bail. The posse tries to triple team Mankind Test this yeah, test fucking snots Pete Gas with a big boot. hmm And you get the you get the angle of it over Test's shoulder. So you see that like Pete Gas could not duck out of the way. This was full contact. 
Uh, then Babyface, Patterson, and Briscoe come out. Yeah, that was the thing I forgot. Yeah. Mankind and Shane are now alone. Double arm DDT. Mandible Claw is in. China and Triple H then come out. Triple H hits him with a chair and Shane wins. Um, then we have, like, you want to talk about people that the company was constantly trying to send weird messages to? They shot an angle where Shamrock threatens Fink so hard he shits himself. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's definitely funny. Yeah. Like, uh, Shamrock man, does the so exaggerated overacting. It's like, oh, what's that smell? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. The, the Fink did so much for that company. Greatest ring announcer they ever had. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll never, I'll never forgive them for that when they had him introduce Punk and Vince made the commentators just fucking shit all over him. He couldn't even enjoy the moment because they're skidding about him in the background. That's what they do. Whereas it, it was Fink introducing Punk in Madison Square Garden. It should have been so special. No, see, because Punk asked for it, they had to shit on it for some yeah. somehow. Yeah. Fucking horrible bastards, aren't they? Anyway, um, Cole with Austin. Basically, the whole summation of this is his leg's fucked. And, like, he, even though they're trying to sell that this injury might permanently change his career, you can tell Steve Austin, who's paranoid about his spot in real life and doesn't want to take any time off, makes sure to get in. It's like, ah, oh, probably a month and a half at the most. <laughs> He's totally downplaying it. Will Cole is gone. Your leg will never be the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like basically, doctors and storyline are telling him you need to take some time off, time off, and he is refusing to admit that. Mm -hmm. Um, he says Triple H claims he'll never be be the same, and that's a bunch of bullshit. Uh, next up, Lee. Uh, just given your your Instagram habits, I'm going to hand this one over <laughs> to you. Uh, non title evening gown match: Ivory versus Tory. Like what? What do you want me to say? It was a fucking nineteen ninety nine divas title, or women's title match. It wasn't even divas yet. The one thing that I was kind of surprised by here is that Tori is essentially doing the gimmick that Ivory would do within a couple of months. Where like one of the things I loved about Ivory uh, during the Attitude Era was that she was the one of all of them that was just like, "I'm not doing this shit." Mm -hmm. So like in famously in the Miss Rumble thing, she's in like a fucking big yellow jacket <laughs> um, and doesn't want to do it um, and, and that was something I liked about Ivory but here she's coming out in like the evening gown and the sexy lingerie whereas like Tori's just out in like a men's It'll shirt be rough, and short, just yeah. like isn't fucking bothered yeah it's just it's fucking, it's, I don't know like Tori wins what, what do you want uh, the only interesting thing here is Luna came out to break it up yeah but, but was forgot, Luna a face at this point Luna was, um, I vaguely remember her being, like, Tori's, like, wrestling mentor was a thing. Okay. But we're also only a couple of months away from her being, like, the the, the woman who comes between X-Pac and, Kane. X -Pac yeah. and Kane. So I, I assume they drop this pretty soon. Um, Lillian uh, Garcia, who must be brand new around this time. Are, is here with Triple H in China. China says, I don't know who the hell you are, but you got to treat Triple H with respect. Um, and Triple H basically implies if Shawn Michaels interferes tonight on behalf of The Rock, he's never going to walk again. Look at that long-term storytelling they do with Triple H and Shawn. Yeah. yeah. I much prefer the 2002 iteration, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, Al is still looking for Pepper. Uh, Cole and the refs, the geek squad, go congratulate Steph and Test as they're getting into their car and going home. Um, and then we get the world title match, uh, Triple H versus The Rock. I did not remember the brief period of time that was Chainmail Triple Literally H. Literally the first note I have, the lesser seen Chainmail Triple H. <laughs> yeah, I think this is why he hated Scott Steiner so much. <laughs> um, it's, it's mad how similar they are. Yeah. Um, I have some Triple H and Rock stats for you. Go for it. So... Over the, the entirety of their careers, there have been 171 total matches involving Triple H and The Rock. Mm. There have been 86 of those matches on TV and pay-per-view. Do you want to guess how many of them uh, 
where 1v1 matches on TV and pay-per-view. Oh, so there's the their SummerSlam match the previous year. Mm-hmm. There's this. There's Judgment Day. Like, I'm going to guess, just the way you've said that, it's surprisingly few. Well, just give, give me a, a rough guess. 86 total matches on TV and pay-per-view. Is it like 15? 28. Oh, not that far and off. Like, when you consider, the first one would have been like, what? So Rock comes in late 96. So say yeah. from 97 through, what, 2000? That's the other thing. These two were getting elevated up the card at almost exactly the same time. Like, The Rock, like, jumps him by about a year. Like, so he gets Mm. elevated last year towards the end of the year, and now Triple H is getting elevated. But they have roughly been in each other's circle. Like, until Rock leaves to do movies, they were at the same level in the company almost the entire time both of them were there. Like, so, like I was saying, like, so you're talking 97 through what 2001 mm. like late 2001 is when um rock really kind of starts disappearing like he does WrestleMania. Yeah. he disappears for, he di- he disappears after x7 until SummerSlam. yeah and by the time he comes back triple h is gone that's right so like most 2001 is completely written off in terms of them wrestling 2002 they're and- not they're on the same side of the roster, so they're not interacting. Yeah. Um, and then Rock is gone by... Also, they get split, don't they? Doesn't Triple H go yes. to Raw and That's Rock right. goes to SmackDown? So they're, they're basically on separate rosters up until SummerSlam where um, Rock is gone. Yeah, Rock does the job to Brock and then So you're gone. basically talking between 97 and 2000. They have 86 matches on TV and pay-per-view. Yeah, that's a lot. And the thing is, like, and I I hate to admit it, like, because I hate it when they get me WWE nowadays. But that moment at like WrestleMania thirty one, where the two of them faced off, there was a little bit of me that was just like, oh, this yeah, is that, cool. was. No, no, fair, that was. Yeah, that was. Like, cool. now if they wrestle, it would be dog shit. Now, but there's still like. God, the magic is there when the two of them just stare at each other. Like, it's like, you know, it's one of those things from that period of time, like whenever Vince and Austin are in the same ring and you're like, you know, a stunner is coming. There's that little bubble of excitement when you see these two guys because you can't help but but think about this period what, of was time. Was it like two years ago they did the, the Cena Orton standoff? Two or three years ago at the yeah. Rumble? And everyone yeah. just went, hey, uh, yeah. That's... Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, like, they wanted it to be this yeah, feud. So whereas, badly. like you said, when Triple H and Rock went face to face, it was oh shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think of the match? Pretty good TV match, I thought. Like a decent yeah. enough match. Like it's not. Look, you're never going to remember. Yeah, for the amount of interference and shenanigans and bells and whistles they were beholden to, and having Sean as a special guest, I think they did as well as they were going to do. Like, I made note, when The Rock is making his entrance, there's 12 minutes left on the show. So you're yeah. not going to get a big fucking blow away match. Mm. Um, but I thought they, they worked well. Like They, they kind of brawl up to yeah. the stage very quickly. A couple of big spots. Throw China out. They lay the seeds for, you know, Michaels as the ref with being out of position mm. and stuff. So this is the thing, like, I love about the, there is a swerve in this match, and it's not the kind of swerve that's bad, the Vince Russo swerve. It's a really good kind of swerve. Mm-hmm. And that is, uh, the whole story of the match revolves around the idea that Sean keeps missing visual yeah. pins. And you're like, The Rock is going to snap and beat the shit out of Shawn Michaels if this keeps happening and you're waiting and waiting for rock to turn on Sean and then rock starts firing up. He gets into position to do the people's elbow after a rock bottom. And I think as well, this is when Kevin Dunn still had some juice and could still actually shoot camera angles. It's fucking phenomenal. 
you do not know until the foot comes in contact with Rock's chin that a sweet chin music is coming. It is perfect. They do the rock bottom and then he sets up to people's elbows so you get the wide shot of Rock running the ropes and it's only when he comes back from the the back end rope as he's going towards Triple H's body that they switch camera to the, the like it's like it's looking under the bottom rope. It's yeah. fucking such a great camera shot. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Really, really well done. Uh, and as we said, it sets the stage for one of the biggest what ifs. What if they had done a Rock versus Sean program? Because this was also still before Sean had found Jesus. So we might have actually got fun heel Sean. <laughs> you say fun heel Sean. Yeah. I mean, not for him and his lifestyle choices, but like, and not to deal with politically. Mm. But in terms of like his character on screen, he'd still actually say things. I mean, look, we, um, we've seen that whole fucking Sean religious thing was when he wanted to, he'd say stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but overall, what did you think of SmackDown? season premiere. I thought it was really good. I, like they put all their major players on the show. Um look the wrestling it's nineteen ninety nine. The wrestling is not gonna be good. Yeah. For what the WWE product was in nineteen ninety nine this was about they as, showcased what they were. Short of having Austin in the building, you threw everything you could at this premiere. Mm-hmm. And that's to be commended. Like they really they really gave it a go from the off in here. And it shows, like, they absolutely killed Thunder in the ratings tonight. But um, was it bad, yeah? Uh, so, let's switch over, shall mm-hmm. we? Uh, and let's talk about Thunder, episode 77. Uh, also, the, it's the back half from Love of <sighs> Texas, uh, tw- 26th of August, 1998. So, or 1999, sorry. You remember what, uh, what SmackDown did? No, I can't, I can't actually remember. It did a 5.7. Do you know what Thunder did? Guessing the ones. A 2.0. Down 0.5 since last week. Down 0.9 over the last two weeks. That's a whole point. That's a fucking... <laughs> steep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We open and I like... How did they not get higher ratings by kicking off the show with Sid Vicious versus the public enemy? Um, we should say Thunder opened with the, the the WWF warning of presented in the most complete form possible due to original production technical difficulties. Now, yes. to me, I don't think it was production difficulties. It was more that I'd say they replayed the whole Kiss segment on the show. Yeah, I'd say that's definitely that would roughly take up like normally these shows are running about an hour and 25 Mm -hmm. 27 minutes uh on the network and we know the back half of a double shot usually is replay heavy and this was weirdly not replay heavy which makes you nitro recaps on this if any i think yeah yeah uh i can't remember we'll get into it i know there was like the replay of the buzz stern thing and a couple of other bits like that. But yeah, I don't remember any egregious like full matches from Nitro or anything like that like we get sometimes. Um, Public Enemy's gear just gets fucking worse, man. Like for guys who we were just reading had problems doing jobs to people, they had no fucking self-respect in terms of how they presented themselves. They thought so highly of themselves and yet dressed the way they Like just, I get what the gimmick was and I get it was over an ECW but like it's 1999 now you you gotta yeah. evolve somehow you also kind of at a certain point have to be self aware that you are the public enemy be thankful you have a fucking gig mm-hmm. well considering they've already been run out of the WWF at this point yeah yeah there's not a whole lot and they've obviously done ECW to death well, like. they, they burned that bridge they, to yeah. some degrees as well yeah they certainly did um uh, something I noticed about this show, speaking of technical difficulties, how bad was the dubbing of why the music? Why are they dubbing, what, like, why did they dub Sid's music? I don't know. But it's also, they dubbed it so badly that they had to put artificial crowd noise over mm-hmm. it. But, like, I don't know where they picked this 
artificial crowd noise from. It sounded like something out of a fucking Aki wrestling game. Like, this is what I mean by this is probably the worst Thunder we've ever watched. Because between, yeah. like you said, the, like the dubbing is all over the show. It's not just Sid. Well, I mean, Sid's all over the show, so that probably explains it. Um, mm. But, like, the dubbing is so bad. Tanae and Larry go missing for long stints of the show. Um, yeah. Obviously, in their whatever booth they record in, they just went off. Well, no, I'm, I'm guessing it's editing because they must have been talking about Kiss. Oh, maybe. And WWE just don't want to take that fucking See, chance. I, I appreciate how conspiratorially minded you are about this show. But that's the only thing that makes sense to me is that they're plugging Kiss and WWE just are like, we're well, not fucking dealing with Gene Simmons. I also think maybe you're being a little bit generous and WCW are just a shitty wrestling think, company. Well, look, that goes without <laughs> saying. Yeah. Um... um like what the fuck is this like soft 80s Sid dub music as well like whatever about if you're if you're dubbing over music in my view unnecessarily but replacing it with this horse shit like uh, look I've I've done the, the entrance like, music so, rant I can't do it again yeah they're fucking ruining yeah. everything it's just I'm fucking fed up yeah. with them and you know what I actually speaking of great entrances what I watched today and this makes me feel and it's going to make you feel extremely old that today as we're recording this is 27 years since sean and sid at survivor series Ugh. um and they showed the the sid msg entrance where fucking new york was having a bit of sid <laughs> and like that sid wwf music the psycho music so good fucking so class good. man jim johnson should be in the hall of fame anyway that's another yeah. argument um i sid had one great line or not sid um today during this match he yeah. said, it's not Over. a winning streak, it's a body count. Yeah, that's good. And it also then makes more sense as to why nobody's keeping mm-hmm. track of it. Or at least Sid's not keeping track of it. Um, Public Enemy tried to surround and jump Sid. Doesn't work. Both of them eat big boots, then close lines. He pulls at Rocco's face. You can tell sometimes, Lee, that Rocco is trying, but his body is just done for. Whereas Johnny Grunge like, just, Johnny just, Grunge just doesn't yeah. give a shit. It's yeah, yeah, and I uh, look. Rock or rock, I think seems to understand what he is. I think grunge. I, I'm just extrapolating my own personal feelings. I think grunge was probably the problem. Yeah. Mm. Um. Well, you should not emulate the grunge, as we've often said in this program. Um. Beats them both some more. Double choke slam attempt. They fight him off briefly. Irish whip Sid runs through their double clothesline and uh, kills them and pins both of them uh, I love I, I, I tweeted out I love when Sid just says words because he gets distracted in the middle of a promo and forgets his line he has a line here he goes uh, into the camera where he's like and the number grows higher and the anticipation becomes yeah <laughs> I did like that they went to the kind of darkened arena and close up on Sid that was good mm-hmm. I'll give him credit yeah. for that uh, Coach Buzz Stern promo replay Same one from last week yeah mm-hmm. six man tag team match Eddie Guerrero Kidman and Rey Mysterio versus the West Texas Rednecks of Windcom and Kendall Windham with Kurt Hennig um, um, were, were you stunned to find out that the Windlums won the tag titles on Nitro <laughs> I was Lee I was they really they really underplayed that like, I kind of mentioned, or, or at least I alluded to on the last show, that uh, I wouldn't be holding out much hope for a long Harlem Heat title reign. Because uh, I knew they dropped them on Nitro, but I forgot to who. Oh, my God. Did, and so, th- here's the thing. They show the full Rednecks entrance. They don't have the belts. Yeah. Because it got recorded beforehand. The week before. And their continuity is dodged. They had set up Harlem Heat versus the First Family for the titles. Mm-hmm. And they have to cut out the entrances because Harlem he have the titles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this show is fucking dog shit. It's so yeah, bad. That was your thing, wasn't it? You were going to check out. They they promoted two matches to happen on mm-hmm. this show, and did they deliver either of them? One of them. This mm-hmm. one wasn't. This was one of them, was it? Yeah. Um, I, one of my favorite things in the West Texas Rednecks gimmick is when Kurt Hennig has a big serious face, face while he's lip syncing rap as crap. Well, this wasn't rap as crap. It was the other one, wasn't it? 
No, no, it was Rapper's Crap. Yeah, this week it was Rapper's Crap. There's no consistency in which one they do anymore. Um, do you know what I was thinking here? And it's, a dep- it's more of a depressing sign on WCW than a positive sign about these guys. The West Texas Rednecks is maybe the best booked long-term WCW angles in this period of time. <laughs> yeah since january basically yeah they get reactions everywhere they have had memorable segments they have accentuated the positives of the team they have managed to get over this incredibly silly gimmick and now they're helping get a new baby face team forming in opposition to them in the filthy animals so like i don't think for four men who physically couldn't do fuck all anymore and in a couple of cases, couldn't do fuck all to Kendall begin with. Bobby Duncan. <laughs> I, I don't think there is a better balance sheet in terms of like, like absolutely overachieving relative to your physical capabilities. I mean, look, I'll go, I'll go down swinging that the early run of Wyndham and Henning as a team was fucking very good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I think you make a good point. Like they've had a successful run. Mm-hmm. And I look, they've been doing this Eddie Ray and Kidman thing for a couple of weeks now at this point. I kind of want them to get on with it. Yeah. Um, the Wyndhams, they're big lugs, but they're pretty good stiffs for Ray and Kidman to just do their moves in the direction of. Um, Duncan gets the heat on Kidman. Crowd are really into Billy uh, in this building. Uh, they go through a break and the heat is on Eddie. Uh, Kendall hits an avalanche back suplex. Ray has to break it up. Um, huge chance for Eddie. Barry hits him with a superplex, which has to be broken up again. Eddie manages to hit his springboard head scissors and tag in uh, to Ray, who goes wild. Kidman assists a sunset flip, which has to be broken up, and the match breaks down. Ray goes out for a rough rider, but gets nailed by Hennig with the cowbell. Eddie breaks it up at two. Hennig drags Eddie out of the ring, but Kidman makes the save. Kendall whips Kidman into the fence and goes to work on him. Ray holds off the heels and is able to get back in the ring, hit a top rope Frankensteiner, and they win. Um, Fun little match, I thought. That was, but I thought the psychology of it was a little bit fucked up because yeah. Ray, or uh, Eddie, as you said, got, was getting very loud chance. But Eddie was the guy that got the heat on. Yeah, I mean, to me, Eddie is the guy you do the hot tag to. Yeah. I guess it's you have trio of three very good hot That's tag true. guys is that the problem is there <laughs> yeah um, against a team of three not very good hot tag um, <laughs> yeah look it was, fun, look, it was fine little TV match um, the, red, the rednecks and obviously yeah, the rednecks out. have to get their heat back afterwards and Harlem Heat like you say make the save yeah uh, Gene is out with Rick and Sid and I'm just like how do you keep giving these men microphones I, I put this on Twitter when I was watching Rick Steiner has to be one of the worst fucking promos. Like, why does nobody talk about how fucking awful this guy is? Well, we we do yeah, talk about how um, awful he is now as a person. Much as much as we love Sid, like for the second time in as many weeks, he dismisses even keeping track of the streak that he's on, which is the whole fucking point of the angle mm-hmm. is that he's going to beat Goldberg's streak. So, like, you repeatedly saying you don't keep count of it is fucking like why would i be i know you're i know they're working the numbers we've all figured that out now at this stage but like how could you even pretend to get invested when the guy who's doing it is like i don't give a shit yeah you say that but then he rips the piss out of the revolution and it's worth it yeah calls them midgets (laughs) says they're policemen and their job is to make sure a revolution doesn't start and then yeah rick gets on the promo dog shit yeah, dog face gremlin fucking delivers dog shit again. I know you popped huge for this next vignette. Tanae confirms that on Monday we will see Berlin. We see words flash on the screen. Technical, <clears throat> determined, victorious. Technical. Yeah. Um, our next match. Fucking hell. Uh, Ernest the Cat Miller versus Prince Ikea, the flat pack sovereign. The dubbing again all oh, over the so fucking bad. place during this entrance. It's so bad. Um, I thought it was funny that they bring out Prince. Um, I did like that bit. But it's funny when you consider what he would go on to become. 
Yes. Yeah. And I wonder, is this where the seed was planted? It could be. Uh, they do a thing where they're like, they're talking about, oh, Prince is coming out tonight. He's here tonight. And then Sonny starts singing a painful cover of Purple Rain that I thought was bad, but then he does it for so long. Becomes good. I thought it was, it really was so funny. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just kept doing it. <laughs> He goes through about three choruses of Purple Rain. It's great. <laughs> but he only purple knows rain. the words Purple Rain. Uh, and then he remembers a couple more words for the last refrain of it. But yeah, it's very funny. Prince Ikea emerges. Uh, Kat says uh, if he doesn't beat him in less than three minutes, he will leave the town and never return, which gets a pop. An extremely boring match breaks out. Uh, Tanae says... Bischoff is the leading cab, uh, candidate to run WCW now. Sonny causes a distraction uh, and a shoe-assisted feline to the back of the head for the win for a cat. Bad. I just picked up that Luger returned on Nitro during this match. Oh, I didn't even yeah, hear that. They, they mentioned that Luger came out and told Sting that he shouldn't trust Hogan. I have no ability to keep track of when... Lex Luger is on and off TV anymore. It feels like he disappears and returns every. I'm pretty of sure months. he's back now for the remainder of the run until he gets taken out by the the uh, thrillers. Oh God! So like you're looking at we're so much you're, ahead. You're of looking us. at a solid like nine months of Flexi Lexi. Oh, lovely, lovely stuff. Uh, speaking of lovely stuff, there's the opposite of that. Brian Nobbs oh and Hugh Morris. God, this so match is dog like dog shit. Versus Dog her this is fucking so bad. shit. Do you know what the uh, do you know what the ultimate sign of it is? Oh, can I just say by the way, a completely apropos of nothing. Since we were talking about Triple H and The Rock, I've stuck on their Iron Man match from Judgment Day 2000. Uh, a couple of minutes into the match, Triple H is about to grab a headlock, and a man walks very slowly past the hard cam in the crowd with a sign that says "Cum Dog" <laughs> with two M's. <laughs> wrestling um a big sign of how bad this match is gonna be is that we start the segment with both teams already well in the ring. That, that's a uh, editing choice yes um it's like do we even want to get into this like it's 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 i'm looking at my couple they've, of notes they've, they've, it's horrible it's brian Nobbs and fucking hugh morris working over steve you there's nothing to get into it's fucking yeah Dog shit. <laughs> yeah. Booker wins the match uh, basically by missile drop kicking Morris and Steve. The most the important spot of the match. God bless Nick Patrick. Uh, Hugh Morris runs over Stevie Ray with a shoulder block and Stevie does not kick out. Yeah. <laughs> Stevie Ray is so funny. Nick Patrick just has to go uh, two and the shoulders up. Stevie didn't budge. Like, he didn't even twitch. Yeah. He might have died. <laughs> it's fucking... Oh, man. I, I feel so bad for Booker T. Um, this next little vignette I liked. It was a new Buzz Stern one. Firstly, I enjoyed his new catchphrase. I'm Coach Buzz Stern and you're not. Um, He's in the power plant... And he's talking about never has a man drowned in his own sweat to try and motivate them. And I thought this is actually one of the truest to life gimmicks WCW has ever run. Because if this is what it's like when people are trying to teach people how to wrestle at the power plant, it explains so much. Does it though? Does it explain horseshoe? (laughs) Do you know what is very funny as well is that he's doing this and absolutely everybody in the power plant is ignoring him. Um, What did you think of his other gimmick or his other catchphrase of OTSS yeah he's trying to do this acronym thing because he was doing it in the first vignette as well and I'm not I'm not wild about it Uh, OTSS for those not in the know means only the strong survive yeah this gimmick gets Um, dropped very quickly right yeah yeah it does well we said on the last thing he makes one televised appearance managing the guy from the first skit and I think that's it Thank then. God. Um, This is like, it's very funny because it's very like 1999 Simon Dean. Ah, Simon Dean was funny. Um, 
Yeah, well, look, and it went on for a lot longer. Yeah, but there was also, you know, a lot of good stuff with Simon Dean. Um, Next up, Dean Malenko and Shane Douglas versus disorderly conduct. I was like, fuck's sake. I wrote, Jesus, they're digging anyone up on this show. Yeah. When, when, you got, when, you, when you can have me and Mike and Shane Douglas face off, Dave, you just got to do it. The chick I wrote, the chickens are coming home to roost in this tag division. They need teams for the revolution and Harlem Heat to wrestle. But since they tried to rehab the tag division last time, they've just killed everyone again. Like, they're obviously trying with the rednecks again. Yeah. So their, their thinking must be, well, we'll get the rednecks involved and at least yeah. we have a heel And team. they're trying with, they're doing something with the filthy animals as well, but that's like a trio rather mm-hmm. than a tag. Um... There was a cool bit in this match. The only thing that was, I was worth um, writing down was a very smooth uh, Douglas reverses a scoop slam into a roll up. I thought that looked pretty nice. And then because it's Texas, Dean wins it with a clover leaf. Absolute waste of time. Yeah, it was shit. Douglas was gassed the fuck by the end of it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of absolute waste of time, DDP versus Chavo. What the fuck? <sighs> they exchange your mama as fat jokes yeah that's that's the setup for this match yeah I I have no words I just that uh, no words yeah Chavo who's barely been seen on this show in months yeah DDP jumps Chavo at the bell, batters him over the rail, back in, through a commercial break somehow. Chavo hits a head scissors, runs into a spine buster. DDP lets him up at two, uh, does a foot choke. A couple of roll-up efforts from Chavo before Paige decapitates him with a clothesline. Uh, Larry is very distracting in this match because he keeps trying to insist that uh, Paige's Christian name is Diamond. <laughs> keeps just referring to him as Diamond. Uh, and then basically... He wins by hitting a fireman's carry diamond cutter, by which I mean he hits him with a TKO. Well, the, yeah, he does hit him with a TKO. Yes, he does. But the whole <laughs> thing... I like that you were just like, I'm not giving that motherfucker credit. And then you're like, yeah. The whole thing with the diamond cutter, obviously, was that came out of nowhere. And that's... They were kind of yeah. re-establishing that, I think. Yeah, but the thing about that, I, I totally love, and we talked about it for ages, like the we love the diamond cutter coming out of nowhere but this was like him elaborately setting up a diamond cutter with another move so it feels like they're trying to do it but they also don't understand what made it fun the first time yeah it's just um but anyway yeah. Shit. uh next match tag team match rick steiner and sid Ver- vicious versus chris benoit and perry saturn I am yelling, Lee. I am yelling 24 years into the past in the hope that my shouting will time travel and someone will hear me. Stop letting <laughs> Sid and Rick have the I microphone. Said, literally, my note there. Sid has the mic again. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> I love Sid. I genuinely love Sid. That man should not yeah. have three promos on any show. No. Penzer says... Penzer tells people... That Sid says they are the crowd aren't worth him talking, even though he already did twice on this show. We're doing show. show bits on Thunder Dev. That's yeah. what we've come yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Although half these cunts wouldn't even fucking show up on a house that, show. That is true. Disorderly conduct are going Broadway on a house show because there's so much space. Ugh. Um. Benoit outsmarts Sid and nearly catches him in a crossface very quickly. Rick tags in for the heat. <laughs> then I wrote, Rick is bad. I don't... <laughs> it's... It's... it's what, what more can we say? Like... Rick, Rick is so bad that he's trying to drum up heel heat for the team and people are completely ignoring his entire existence and chanting at Sid. I wish I could... I wish apron. I could ignore his existence. Yeah. Um, lots of empty chairs during this. Uh, Benoit nearly catches Sid during a long heat spot, but Sid goes right back to work on him. Benoit, in fairness to him, is doing his best to milk the heat for all it's worth to make these lads look good. 
Benoit fights back, manages to slam Sid. The crowd goes mad for that. Misses the headbutt. Hot, uh, ironically, a hot tag that cools down the match <laughs> because everybody was way more into Benoit. So once he tagged out, people lost interest. Uh, double 10 punch spot does get them back on board, though, from the baby faces. The heels knock out Benoit. Sid gets a power bomb on Saturn as Be- as Benoit is trying to get the crossface in on Rick. Ref bump. Robinson comes out, counts the pin. Now we're back doing the "Hey, it's you, Ric Flair's personal referee" thing because Benoit realizes who it is, shoves Robinson over, Sid power bombs him, Douglas and Malenko come out in the heels bail. Just a fucking mess and a waste. Of Just time. imagine that if the big plan was to put Douglas with. With uh, Rick Steiner and Sid. Yeah. And have him wrestle singles against Malenko. Oh, God. This fucking company, man. Yeah. I, I actually, I genuinely feel like the tide is torn now to the point where it's unsavable. You know the way we would say up to a point in 1999, they could have torn things around. I think we're beyond mm-hmm. that now. And we've still got Russo to come, mm-hmm. baby. At least it's going to get funny. That's the hope. That's, That's the one hope. thing. Um, that's why we've invested all this time. But anyway, um, give me your uh, overall thoughts on the show, winners and losers. I I genuinely I don't think there's anybody that comes out the better because of the show. <laughs> Is can I get can I offer a selection? Sure. The winner is anyone who watched UPN <laughs> that night true. instead, and there was a lot of those people. There was a lot. Um, yeah, now, look, that it's a total nothing. Like, the fact that they put this up against SmackDown. Yeah. Like, I, I understand they knew they weren't going to win. But still, you yeah. don't put this up against them. You don't punt. No. Like, you, you do some sort of an effort. Ah, uh, this fucking company, man. It's just getting worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it ain't getting better, mm-hmm. sir. Uh, let's finish it up with the traditional uh, finish counter brought to you by Ludwig Borga, which gives us shockingly, shockingly, six clean finishes and one interference leading directly to a finish. Um, it was a bad fucking episode of television. It was man. real bad. Real, real bad. And even though, like, in the ring, in the ring, SmackDown was on a par. It was a much hotter product and much more entertaining apart from the wrestling. Yeah, I think I think that's it. Like we we've any time we've gone over to the WWF nineteen ninety nine, we've said, I can't believe this is what they were losing to. But it's just it was yeah. the hot product and that's what it was. Yeah. And WCW brought it on themselves. They just couldn't get out of their own way. Hmm. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, that's going to bring to an end this bumper edition of Days of Thunder. Thanks for listening in. Uh, We really appreciate it. Uh, We shall talk to you all again very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for listening to another episode of Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder was produced by Lee Malone and edited by me, Dave Ryan. Keep up to date with the show and find all the ways to listen to us. You can follow us on Twitter at WCW ThunderPod or click the Linktree link in our Twitter bio or in the show notes. I am at the day to Dave on Twitter and Lee is at Malone underscore 713. Days of Thunder is a part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. Follow the VOW network anywhere. Good podcasts are sold for more fine podcasts than you can shake a stick at. Thanks.
Hey everybody, my name is Jesse Collings, and I want to tell you all about my show, The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. On The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, we do a thorough analysis on the biggest issues and trends within the pro wrestling industry. We talk a lot about pro wrestling media, we talk a lot about fan culture and wrestling's place within general pop culture, and we talk about the broader influences that are shaping the way we discuss and analyze the pro wrestling industry. We've had some of the brightest minds in the pro wrestling intelligentsia on the show, including WrestleNomics host Brandon Thurston, both Rich Krejci and Joe Lanza from the Flagship Wrestling Podcast, Trevor Dame from the Through the Years Podcast, and a whole lot more. This isn't a show for hot takes. It's not a show recapping the latest episode of television. This is a show focusing on the biggest topics in pro wrestling and doing a deep dive on the real stories behind the surface level analysis you might find elsewhere. The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a try. Thanks.